The New Testament scripture reading for this morning, as well as the sermon text, comes from John chapter 16, beginning in verse 5. Now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you ask me, where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief, but I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, he will se- I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because of the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the, whole, uh, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by talking f- or taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said, the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. In a little while, you will see me no more, and then after a little while, you will see me. Some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while, you will see me no more, and then after a little while, you will see me, and because I am going to the Father. They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this. So he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said in a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. I tell you the truth. You will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn into joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come, but when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will tell no, or you will no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming, and I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about uh, about my Father. In that day, you will ask in... uh, In that day, you will ask in my name. I'm not saying that I will ask the Father. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. Let us pray together. Lord, we indeed thank you that you have spoken and that you have made yourself known to man and that we can know you through your word. Father, we pray that you would reveal yourself to us through your word, that you would uh, increase our faith and strengthen us by your word and through the power of the Holy Spirit and that you would do all these things even this very hour. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. About 20 years ago, there was a popular uh, Christian praise song that uh, was making the circuit through the evangelical church in America. Uh, It hasn't lasted. It's not one of those songs that uh, has continued to be sung. Uh, It's not really still around because it wasn't that great of a song. Um, But that song basically repeated the same lines over and over 
again and again, forever and ever, amen. Uh, it was kind of like singing Kumbaya, uh, my Lord, this one line, this one phrase, singing it until, until you're sick of hearing it. But the line in the song you would repeat over and over again was, I'm trading my sorrows, I'm trading my shame, I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. And you would say that same thing several times throughout the song, and then the chorus would say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes. Um, God. <laughs> Without getting uh, into it too much, years later, this song really began to bother me. Uh, but what bothered me, and there are multiple issues that bother me, but I'll just tell you about one. What came to bother me most about this song is that you repeat this line over and over again about trading your sorrows and uh, receiving instead the joy of the Lord. And that d the desire is that you would do that, that you're supposed to let go of whatever is weighing you down, whatever your uh, uh, life uh, is in your life that is making you sad and unhappy, and ultimately you are to let go of those things, forget about these real trials and these real tribulations in your life, just forget about them, and have the joy of the Lord right now. Enjoy this moment of almost ecstasy as the song is trying to bring you into. You know, you know that we're supposed to be happy, clappy Christians at any given moment in our lives. And so this song calls us to forget about everything just even for a moment and get so caught up in the song that it's almost like a high. You forget everything else. But what ultimately came to bother me is that the song calls us to forget about our troubles and to have the joy of the Lord, and it never gives a reason for why. Why it is that we are called to turn from sorrow to joy. You're just sort of supposed to believe that you can because you've said the same line over and over again. And you've said so many times that it must be true that you can do so. But no reason is ever stated why it is that we ought to have joy instead of sorrow. And ultimately the fact that there is no foundation for the sense of joy is why it is so easy to fall back into depression again or sorrow and grief. It was easy to lose that high of joy when you were done singing the song, when you were back to the real world, when real problems were waiting for you once you were done. Because there are real problems in the world. Those were real Thing. There are real things that you are dealing with and you can understand them because they are real and painful and you couldn't escape them completely. And why we aren't supposed to get caught up in suffering and sorrow, but to have joy and said, there's a lot of reasons to be filled with sorrow in this world. There's a lot of pain in this world that we experience and we can understand those things because they are very uh, concrete to us. But the question is, is there a reason for joy? Is there a reason for joy, for true joy, not just happiness for a moment because you've convinced yourself that you can, can be joyful because you've said it over and over again, but for a joy that is so powerful and strong that it shapes you in the midst of whatever trials and tribulations you face? Well, people of God, according to Christ, according to our text this morning, there is a reason for joy amidst the sorrows of this world. Our text opens up. And the first thing we see is the sorrow of the disciples. The sorrow of the disciples. As you come to verse 5, Jesus is still speaking with his disciples. He's been speaking with them uh, 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 about uh, many things that he will leave with them. Again, this is a, a very long discourse from chapter 13 all the way through. Uh, uh, the kind of ends in this chapter and turns into a prayer in chapter 17. But it's all one continuous dialogue between Christ and his disciples. He's been speaking about how the church is to love one another after he departs. He's told them of the promise of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit will come after Christ leaves to the place where the disciples cannot go. He's told the disciples about the hatred of the world and how they ought to expect the world to treat them in the same way that they treat the Christ with disdain and bitter hatred. You know, this whole time, each of these topics that Christ touches on and teaches on, they all continue 
or con- and connect to the reality that Christ is about to depart from his disciples. He's going away and he is leaving them behind. And here, Christ specifically returns back to that main point. He doesn't just allude to it here as in other sections, but he says it very plainly and very directly. I'm going to him who sent me. I'm returning to the Father who sent me into the world to save it. My mission is done. It is complete. Yet not one of you is interested in that completed work. Not one of you has cared to find out where I am going or why. You see, the disciples can't seem to get over the fact that Christ has said, I'm going away, and where I go, you can't come. They're stuck back at step one. They love their Lord. They love their master. They want to continue to follow him. They want to be face to face with this one that they love. And as, uh, uh, you know, even students would love their teacher. And they are troubled and downcast and sorrowful. And this uh, uh, kind of demeanor has cast a shadow over everything that Christ has said. Because they don't know what to do without Jesus with them any longer. And it seems like Christ is saying, you don't even... You don't even ask where I'm going like he's disappointed. He's sharing wonderful news for himself that we should be rejoicing in, and the disciples just can't rejoice with him. But don't read this incorrectly here. Don't don't read it that way. The disciples can't rejoice right now because they are just plain sorrowful. It is a deep personal sorrow that they are experiencing, so much so that they aren't able to think about anything else but their own troubles. You know, we do this all the time. You know, when we have particular troubles um, that uh, seem overwhelming to us, we have a hard time thinking about others and how we can rejoice with others despite what's going on in our lives. Now, think of the family that has to move to a different state because the dad got a promotion, you know, and the teenage children, they're told that they can't be happy for their father. And they may not even care where they're moving to. All they see at the moment is that their particular, li- or particular lives are being turned upside down. They're being pulled away from their friends and, and their schools. They're losing everything they know and they love. It's kind of like that here. The disciples can't care about what Christ reasons for leaving them are when they're still dwelling on the fact of how his leaving affects them. And they're just being human. They're seeing their own problems first and sorrow has filled their heart. Grief has overwhelmed them. And because of all of these Christ, uh, things, Christ has told them concerning himself. He's told them all these things and they are sorrowful. So Jesus begins to explain to them why they shouldn't be sorrowful. He gives them reasons to uh, 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 to not be downcast in the face of these disappointments that are before them. You know, Christ doesn't just say, buck up, kid, it it will all be okay. You know, you can deal with this. Uh, he, He gives them reasons. He walks through things with them so that they might know that about God's plan for their life is a good plan and not, uh, you know, despite all appearances, that it is not a bad one, but that it is good and indeed the best one. First, Christ says, you shouldn't be sorrowful because the Holy Spirit is going to come to you when I leave. I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the advocate, the comforter, the promise. Holy Spirit will not come to you, but if I go, I can send him to you and will send him to you. So Christ says, you shouldn't be sorrowful because I promised to send you the Holy Spirit. But if you're in the disciples' shoes and you don't know what that means, and you know that the Savior is leaving, you ask yourself, why does that matter? Why does that change The disciples sorrow from uh, sorrow into joy. Not to stretch the analogy too far, but it's again like that father telling his teenage son as the family prepares to move, don't worry, you know, I know you're in a serious relationship right now, but there are other fish in the sea. You'll forget all about Sarah, and I'm sure that you'll meet someone even better. You aren't even ready to get married yet. And it kind of sounds hollow when you're the one going through it, when you're the one experiencing it. 
But in some ways, Jesus is saying it's going to be better in ways that you can't even conceive of right now, in ways that you can't even comprehend right now. And you have to trust me. You have to trust the will of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and that it is a good will. And you can trust our plan is a good plan and it is going to be magnificent, but it means that I have to go away and you have to trust me that these things will be good for you. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit in my place and he will come and he will bear witness to this world and he will bear witness concerning this world that hates me and hates you because of me. And your uh, translation might say something like he will convict the world, the Holy Spirit will convict the world or prove the world wrong. But the Greek is something more like the Holy Spirit will expose the world when he comes. He will bring it to light. He will expose it to the light. In other words, he will stand. As the Holy Spirit comes, he will come as in a courtroom setting, and he will bear witness against the world, exposing it of all its evil deeds and of its hatred of the light and cause it to be judged rightly. Indeed, showing forth the sin of the world because it would not believe in me but rejected me utterly. Ultimately, that is the sin that the world is held accountable for. We are all sinners, but what the world is held accountable for is for the rejection of him who is the way, the truth, and the life. And the Holy Spirit, and Jesus says the Holy Spirit will come and he will bear witness about that truth that they do not believe in me, that they utterly reject me. The world rejects Christ who is the righteous one, the one who will be vindicated in his death before he enters into the presence of the Father. Despite the fact that Christ will be accused as a criminal and die at the death of a criminal, the Holy Spirit will come and it will enter or, or, or expose the world's lie for what it is. Christ is the truly righteous one. He is the Lamb of God come into the world to save sinners and he will be vindicated and he will be blameless and true and we can believe it because he entered again into the presence of the Father in whom no sin can dwell. And so the Holy Spirit, it will come, it will help us to see the lies of the world which still condemn Christ, calling him a lunatic or a liar, when he is truly the Son of God. In fact, the Holy Spirit, it says, will expose, so it will expose our sin or the sins of the world. It will expose the righteousness of Christ and it will bear witness against the ruler of this world who is judged already. The father of lies who spreads false judgments about the Christ. He is condemned already by the actions of Christ on the cross this very night, he will have no victory in this world. And the Holy Spirit bears witness to this reality that the ruler of this world has been defeated upon the cross of Christ and judged in Christ's victory. And the prince of the power of the air stands condemned already. Jesus says, for all these reasons, for the witness of the Holy Spirit against the world's sin, concerning Christ's righteousness for its witness against the ruler of this world, you ought not to be sorrowful, but be filled instead with joy. And we hear this, and again, we think, why? What is the sense in this? I mean, Christ is basically saying, don't be sorrowful, because when I depart, the Holy Spirit will come. And that Holy Spirit will help you as you can, it condemns the world and its sinfulness. It will help you as you continue to run the race that is set before you. It will help you to continue to believe in the righteousness of Christ that is set uh, because he has been returned to the Father's presence. And the Holy Spirit will strengthen your faith because the ruler of this world is conquered. And the Holy Spirit will guide God's people in all truth and glorify the Son. But disciples, They hear this good news, all these wonderful things that the Holy Spirit will do for God's people. And yet all they really want is to see their Savior face to face. They're still bowed down with sorrow and with grief and with pain. And so Christ gives them another reason for joy. A reason for joy. As you come to verse 16, Christ 
says this extremely confusing word to his disciples. He says, yet a little while and you won't see me. Seems straightforward enough. But then he says immediately following it, again, a little while and you will see me. And the disciples are immediately confused. And it's expressed here in the text. What does he mean by this? And honestly, Christ's words are very strange here. It'd be like me saying, yet a little while, and we'll all have pizza. And again, yet a little while, and we will not have pizza. And you would hear that, and you would say, he's contradicting himself, or, or he is just confused. What is going on? It's very odd language, very uh, a very unusual way of expressing something. Uh, to use the exact same words in both a positive and then a negative like this. It's almost as though there was still a bit of mystery to what Christ is preparing his disciples. Like he won't tell them plainly or his going to the, about his going to the cross. So what is it that Christ is talking about here? What is it that he means when he says, yet a little while? Well, in verse 20, Christ elaborates more about what he's talking about. He doesn't exactly explain it perfectly, but he elaborates on it. He says, you will weep and you will lament and you will have sorrow. And that sorrow will be real and tangible. And you will be sorrowful because I am leaving. Something is going to happen and it is going to happen soon. And it's going to cause you to weep bitterly because of the pain that is going to cause you. And at the same time, this thing that will cause you pain will also be the source of your joy in the morning. It will cause you to rejoice and they will celebrate. Indeed, these things that will cause you pain will ultimately lead to your joy. These things that will cause you pain, that will cause the world to rejoice immediately. Something we saw in Revelation chapter 11. The world is going to rejoice at the silencing of this particular witness to the world when Christ is uh, um, sent upon the Christ uh, cross. But Christ says, I promise you, you, your sorrows will be turned to joy. It will be reversed. These things that you are going through, they will be reversed. You will be like a woman who is in labor for a time. Right now you are filled with sorrow and that sorrow will last for a time because something is being born into this world upon that stage and something will uh, lead to and uh, a true and lasting joy for you people of God. But just like a woman in labor, you are in the throes of it right now. You can't think about that final uh, 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 end goal. You cannot see beyond the pain of the moment. You cannot see. It is as though they're in a fog and you can't see beyond your hand. They cannot see the end that is in store for them because they are in the throes of this hour of sorrow. But when this particular victory is won, when this particular fruit is brought forth, you will rejoice just as a woman who has born a child forgets all the pain that has gone before, right? I mean, the, they, they call this some kind of forgetful syndrome. The reason women will have multiple children is they've forgotten all the pain that went before because they remember the joy of holding that child in their arms for the first time. And that joy, the, the, the pain that they went through does not compare to what that they hold in their arms, the treasure that is set before them. The sorrow pales in comparison to the joy that is remaining behind. And Christ says, you are in the midst of the throes of labor. Childbirth is upon you and it will be painful and it will grieve you. But this tribulation, it will be light and it will be a momentary affliction. When the fruits of this labor is born from you. People of God, I hope you see what it is that Christ is talking about here. I know he is speaking with illusions. What he is talking about is his death and his resurrection. That's what he means when he says, yet a little while and you will no longer see me. Yet a little while and a great sorrow will be upon you. He's talking about his descent into the grave. This very night, Christ, their Lord and Master, who they have followed for their lives for at least the last three years, 
who may have, will give everything for this Lord and Master, this night will be killed and crucified, and his body will be laid in a tomb. And it will be painful for the disciples because they think all is lost, and they will see him no longer. And yet, and yet Christ says in a little while after that, you will see me again. What he means by that is because I have risen from the dead and I will have become victorious over the grave and sin and death and hell itself. And even the ruler of this present evil age cannot stand against the power and the might of the one who breaks forth victorious from the grave. And nothing that the world says, nothing that the prince of darkness, the father of lies says, will change that reality. And Christ will stand condemned. And it, is through, and it is through sorrow, through these pains, that something will be born of it. Something glorious will be brought forth into the world for the people of God. Christ will be victorious. And he works all these things out so that the righteous, the people of God, might obtain the resurrection of the dead and out of faith have his righteousness bestowed upon him, them. All these things, dear children, are working together by the good and perfect plan of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he tells them, I know you can't see it now. I know you can't get over the pain and sorrow that's in your life that is right before you. And it is a true pain, and it is real pain, and I understand that. But that sorrow will end, and joy will come in the morning. Weeping will last for a night, but joy remains. And the question is, why should it be that this would bring its joy? Why should it change the disciples' attitudes now? Because he will die and rise again as surely as the sun has risen this morning and will set this evening. How does this lead to joy? What does it do for you, people of God? I mean, as we experience all kinds of pains and troubles in this world, you know, he calls us and he points to us and says the death and resurrection of Christ ought to cause joy and cause us to rejoice in this world, in the here and now. And the reason is people have gone, the death and resurrection of Christ, it changes everything for all those who are in Christ, whom he has bought for a price, who he has lived and died in our place. His death cancels out the debt of sin that we own and his resurrection raises us up into the newness of life as we are hid in him. And you see, the people of, or people of God, what that means is that the end of the story is a good ending and it is a good ending for you. And the son returns to the father victorious and he brings his people with him in his train. And if that is true, if that is the ending, everything in the middle, people of God, needs to be understood in light of that good ending. You lost your job, but Christ has died for your sins and brought you into the fullness of the newness of life. You lost your spouse, but Christ is victorious over the grave in his rising. You see, Christ's death and resurrection, they never erase the true pain and sorrow that we go through. They never uh, rid the world of this sorrow that we experience. Jesus admits to the disciples that they will go through sorrow. You will have difficulties in this life, but there is joy, and that joy is held out for you, people of God. We have a reason to rejoice, rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Why? Because the Lord is at hand and he has delivered you from death to life, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. He has had your ultimate good in mind. And we may not be able to see it at the moment, but he cares for his people, people of God. He cares for you. There is a reason that he will undergo these trials and difficulties. And it is for you that you might see God face to face one day. And it calls into question how we act in this life. You know, do we really have a right to complain when things don't go just right? You know, when things don't seem to go according to our plan, we complain and we slander and we backbite because we cannot see the end of the story. 
When we turn our eyes to the moment, to the trial, we cannot look beyond our own hand in front of us. We cannot see beyond what is before us. And we see these trials and we say, because you have done this thing to me, surely you cannot care to me, care for me. You do not care for me, and so I will complain, and I will fail to trust and believe the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ who has done so much for us. People of God, if you are in a moment of sorrow, and if you're not right now, you will be, remember, the end of the story is good for his people, and it is a good ending for you, whatever may come. And if you find yourself complaining because life is not the way it's supposed to be, turn your eyes to the one who is the author of this life, whose will is being accomplished even this day, who was ordering the world in such a way that not a hair can fall from your head without his knowing. Turn to that one, the one who has sent forth his only son as the slain lamb who sits victorious upon the throne at the right hand of God and remember and believe that the end is good in him and may that reality shape the middle of the story the troubles and trials that you go through now where we live when all seems dark and when all seems lost when pain and sorrow are about to overcome you when you feel as though the waters have come up about your next turn your eyes to Christ Jesus who died and rose again and with his dying and rising, joy comes in the morning for you, people of God. May we rejoice, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice because of the death and resurrection of our Savior that changes everything for us. Amen. Let us pray.